hard to press the record button on this thing. Anyway, I'm back in the truck. Got a little more daylight. Uh, there was something I had remembered, and it was we'll make this a part two, uh, or maybe a part three of the uh, the previous topic that I was talking about, and I haven't titled it yet, so I'll just you have to follow me on this one. I'll just make this one part three. Now the thing with it, when I was talking to this guy from last night, he goes, um, and once again we're back in this Al Sharpton thing. Now he's sitting there telling me Al Sharpton is going to be the the next. He's going to be the next uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And I got offended at that, man, because I'm like, he ain't nowhere near Dr. Martin Luther King. And first of all, Dr. Martin Luther King died when he was 39, right? He so believed in his cause that he put his life on the line to the end. He put his life on the line to the end. And I'm not really sure if I should be explicit, so I'm going to put a, a disclaimer there at the bottom. If I do decide to be explicit, I really won't know because I'm just going off my head because – I really wanted to discuss everything that we talked about last night and how I felt insulted. Because what he had said, okay, I guess I have to be explicit there. He said, well, you just some jive-ass street nigga. Now, I've, I've made concerted effort here to actually speak proper, and I'm not saying that, you know, I can't speak that way. But my thing is, when you tell someone that they don't agree, uh, they don't agree with your interpretation that Al Sharpton is going to be the next Martin Luther King, that he's some street nigga, that's offensive, man. That's offensive because what you do is invalidate everything else that he's going to say. Now, I'm doing this on the cell phone now because uh, the, camera, the camera's in the house, and I'm trying to upload the other one, the, the one that I made about an hour ago. So I'm going to use whatever's left of battery life on this, and then I'll just put this thing on the charger and then make my run. But anyway, what, what he was saying was that, <clears throat> you know, you just some street nigga. you just talking about, you know, you just, you all braggadocio and all bringing on the street. First of all, I'd like for you to save those connotations for the street niggas you actually meet, all right? Because, you know, I I actually, you know, know I don't know personally Dr. King never did because I was born after he was, di- after he was, after he was assassinated. But what I'm saying to you is that from what I know of Dr. Martin Luther King and from what I know of Al Sharpton, those two people are not the same. They're not the same. They don't have the same moral ethic or ethical guidelines, all right? Uh, uh, for you to tell me that, and then, then and see what really offended me when I said a lot, of, a lot of what he said was insulting. Not that you call somebody a street nigga, because I just let that slide. But what he had said was that I don't know nothing or I don't know anything, and he knows more because he was with the people who were with Dr. King. All right? I want you to understand what I said. He said that what he knows is greater than what I know, because even though I could go to Barnes & Noble, B. Dalton doesn't exist anymore, but you know you can go to a bookstore, you can go to the public library and look up everything, you can go to the Internet, look up everything you can about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. None of it matters because he hung out with the people who hung out with the people who hung out with him. But at its best, it's still anecdotal evidence. It's still anecdotal information. It's third party. You hanging out with this guy, you hung out with Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King. So therefore, what you know is more great is greater than what I know. Do you understand? Now, see, I consider that to be more insulting than calling someone a street nigga. You know what I'm saying? I need you to follow me here. Follow me here because this is the same thing I said in the last video where the people of Indianapolis or the people of St. Louis, they need some guy from New York, they need Jesse Jackson from Chicago to come and validate their, whatever their issues are. You understand what I'm saying to you, right? What you know is not good enough. You need me to tell you what you know. And if I'm pleased with what you know, then you, you actually know it. Look, you should save that argument for a street nigga. Because he will actually believe that. I don't believe that. I don't believe you know. See, once you once you start talking about these, these you start creating a high a hierarchy of, of 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 learning the knowledge, and you know, and you don't know. I know because I studied with this guy, and you don't know because you just read it in a book. Well, who said the book was inaccurate? Who said the guy that you know? Who said the guy that you know that was with that guy wasn't gilding the lily? Why is it we don't find out that Ralph Abernathy was gay until after he died? Right? But what, what, what do I know? I know from what I know about Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, uh, like I said, when you, when, you, when you go on the Internet, then you go, like, then don't, don't try to pretend that there are not ver- veritable sources on the Internet about Martin Luther King in the public library. 
Just like I said before, take all the information that you that you absorb, and, and you don't have to consider all of it as being 100% factual. But take what you believe to be factual and craft your own personal argument around that. Right? I personally, I, I, I am a supporter of Jeremiah Wright. Now, my colleague has a problem with Jeremiah Wright. He doesn't have a problem with Jeremiah Wright. What he said, what he said to me last night was, "You're gonna be one of them people. Forty years from now, you're gonna talk about you love Al Sharpton. There's nothing to love. You see, first of all, the pedigrees don't even match. All right, the pedigrees don't even match. All right. So you want me to believe that some dude is that he, he's just like Martin Luther King? Nah, man, you've been drinking that Kool-Aid, man. Ain't nothing like Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King is dead, and he died." at the age of 39, 1968, because he believed in what he was doing, all right? Al Sharpton is nowhere near Martin Luther King. Oh, well, he can give a good speech, but, you know, given the opportunity and enough preparation, anybody can give a good speech. Oh, well, he can give a good good speech, impromptu speech. Well, same thing. Given the opportunity and plenty of preparation, anyone can give an impromptu speech. Mario Cuomo could give an impromptu speech. Bill Clinton could give an impromptu speech. Okay? Barack Obama could give an impromptu speech. But that doesn't mean that the message was worth listening to. It just was a good speech. His delivery and the topic material was great. But the message was worthless. Okay? You saw Barack Obama and Jay Leno talking about Edward Snowden. What he's saying it sounded good, but it was worthless. So I just mentioned that because I was I was in the house looking for the charging cable for his phone, and it just dawned on me that that was one thing I didn't clarify to you people that you know when he had said that you were a street nigga and you don't know anything because I was with the people that were with the people that was with that guy when they were doing that movement. I mean, come on, man. I mean, you know. It's like, it's like telling me that the principles of Elijah Muhammad are worthless and, and Marcus Garvey are worthless because and, and I don't know those people. You only know it in the book. So, But that's not the question to me. The question to me is, is the information in the book accurate or is it inaccurate? Well, and see, the stipulation is that you knew the person, so word of mouth is more accurate. Word of mouth is more accurate than the information in the book. Well, then we got to disagree. And we've got to disagree, right? Because you know, you know, there's, there's also, yeah. I mean, it, all this stuff is really, man. It's all like parochialism. That's what it is. It's like intellectual parochialism. It is because the people of Detroit, their own issues are not, they're not relevant if some dude from New York doesn't validate them. Now I live in New York, but I don't know what's going on in Detroit, right? The people that live in Kansas City, Missouri, they need me to tell them what they should be doing. They need me to give them the appropriate guidance and instruction on how to do whatever it is that they need to do. Right? So we're talking, man, and, and so you got all these objections. What do you recommend? I just told you. I, I, look, man, if we're not talking about economics, then what are we talking about? Because we're definitely not talking about politi- politics. You know? You're not talking about politics. You're talking about putting your faith in some guy who's not going to do anything nor get anything done. And then, you know, you, you leave like you've always done. You leave with a with a good feeling about yourself and a possible, you know, glad tidings from almost a sense of accomplishment, but you're not really accomplishing anything. You're not getting anything done. And so the year comes in and the year goes out. Same things happen and nothing ever changes. All right? He's telling me, well, if Al Sharpton really, if he was really running the hustle, Jesse Jackson was really running the hustle, they could live in a big house like Creflo Dollar. But they're all one and the same. They're all one and the same. I mean, number one, why is it all of your, your, your visionaries, in quotations, your leaders, in quotations, your, your guiders, in quotations, why do y'all got to come from the church? What's up with that, man? See? Why does it got to be Reverend Al Sharpton and Reverend Jesse Jackson 
and see, I don't want to make these make more most more, a lot of these videos because I don't want to sound like I got a personal vendetta against these people. What I've got is an ideological disagreement with all of this. I got an ideological disagreement with all of this. If you can be like Floyd Flake and you can run that church, Allen A and E Methodist, whatever it is over there on Merrick Boulevard in, in Queens and Jamaica. And then they could use that. You, know, you put money into the, in the, in the into the pot, the collection pot, his tithing. The mega churches guys using that money, and he's expanding the services of the church, getting in the housing projects and senior citizen developments and child care facilities. I don't have a problem with that. But why is it that you need a church to do it? Why is it that the people that live in that area, I don't know, 11432, I think that's the zip code, why can't they collectively pull their money together and get their own thing? Get their own community center. Get their own, I mean, why is it that we need to have, we, not we, why is it that those people need to have someone to tell them what to do? Why do you need a leader? Why can't we just, you know, we brainstorm and come out with a couple of ideas, and then if the idea has merit, if it has salt, if it's sound. If I'm talking to my man T. West, you know, I say, you know, uh, you know, Mr. West, you know, we might want to think about doing something like that. He says, well, yeah, you know, that does make a good idea. That does sound like a good idea, but what we might want to do is flesh it out a little bit, and then we could do this. And I said, well, we can't do that up here because the the, 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 the geography is a little bit different, but there may be something. We could tweak that a bit, and then we go back and forth, and we come up with a, with a, with a solid objective of what we could do to get economic empowerment and community betterment. Right? And then we just do that. I would do that from here, and he would do that from there. Right? Why did why I gotta go through the church? Why everybody gotta be ordained in some church? Because you know, if 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 one if, if you're gonna ordain the messenger or validate or or encourage the messenger to solely come from the church, that means you are also proselytizing the message from whatever whatever the church is. You can't put Floyd Flake up there and then tell me, though, that's the guy that's going to represent this specific issue on for this specific candidate and not make me believe that his opinion is not also the opinion of the people in the church. Because he's like the shepherd of the flock, right? The pastor and everything, right? So when you put some person on there, the National Action Network, and then put Al Sharpton and put a microphone in front of him, that would make it sound like he's speaking for black people nationally. The National Action Network's not really a church. It's a political organization, right? And I'm going to put a microphone in front of him and tell him the issue, and then he's going to speak on that issue. But somehow he's going to say whatever the Democratic Party would want him to say, and if you disagree, comment box below. Prove it. Tell me that he's not advocating all the policies of the Democratic Party and and, 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 and penalizing or ridiculing all of the policies of the Republican Party. Why do parties matter? You're a preacher. Why do the parties matter? First of all, parties don't matter if you're a preacher because all you think about is right versus wrong. Right? Maybe I'm wrong. Right? Or wrong. But, <clears throat> so, that's what I'm saying about this thing right here. So, you know, if I come up with some other things that he said that, that, that really got under my skin, I may, you know, I probably will because I want to get everything off my chest. Because like I said, I left there feeling bad about myself because it made it sound like my arguments had no merit. And the things that I know, I don't really know them. They're not true, and I'm just making them up. They are fiddle-faddle for the mind, you know, because he's engaged in intellectual parochialism but what he knows is more, more is more important than what I know because he knows the people that were there, and you know, and, you know, it's laughable. It's laughable because you know, if you know the people, and they live here. If you know about the Booker T. Coleman, and he lives here, and you know Phil Valentine, and he lives here, you know, you mean to tell somebody else that what they know is not is not really relevant or pertinent or, or important or pertinent because you live because you live you live in Las Vegas. And I live in New York, so what I know is better than what you know. Now, if I tell you that and you laugh at me, I expect that. Because it's not like you can't get the information. If you live in Los Angeles, or if you live in San Francisco, 
or if you live in El Paso? Is it hard for you to get the information, or is your information less valid because you you had to use the mail system or UPS or the Internet to get it versus he got it from the dude who presumptively was speaking about his experience factually? You don't know. I'm going to pull. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to stipulate that a lot of guys may have been gilded in the lily. Even if they write the book, I told you, do not believe everything that everyone says. But all right, I'm going to put this thing on the charger and then make my run to the post office. So I'll get up with you guys later on. Thank you very much. I had to turn this thing off.